So let's just kind of finish off by talking about the centripetal force. And any force directed towards the center is going to be called a centripetal force, or center seeking towards the center force. If you think about this girl right here, she's whirling a can on a string, and she has to be constantly pulling it inwards to pull it into a circle. So kind of if I were to look at this guy from above, and this is going to be the can you know, at several different points, then if I had a hammer or, some, or something like that, or a bat, then what I kind of have to do is, as this thing is kind of going around in a circle, then I need to hit it just like that. I need to hit it right here. I need to hit it inward. I need to hit it inwards. I need to hit it inwards, hit it inwards, hit it inwards. So the force has definitely got to be towards the center. There is no um, force pulling this can outwards. Now, how much force does it take to pull something around in a circle? Well, it's going to depend on the mass. It's going to depend on the speed and how tight of a circle. So kind of in equation form, the centripetal force is going to be equal to the mass times the speed squared divided by the radius. And let's just kind of do a quick little calculation. Suppose we had a mass of 5 kilograms, and we decided we wanted to swing it around at a speed of, let's just say, 1 meter per second. And the radius is going to be 0 0.5 meters. And the amount of force is going to be 5 kilograms multiplied by 1 squared divided by 0 0.5, or a force of 10 newtons. One thing to kind of keep in mind is that as the mass increases, then, then the centripetal force would also increase. As the speed increases, well, we all know that if you swing something around a circle faster, then it takes more force. And keep in mind that it's going to go like speed squared, not like speed. And lastly, as the radius gets larger, then the centripetal force is actually going to go down because we're dividing by a larger number. And I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't already know. You know that if you swing something in a tight circle, it takes a lot of force. In a large circle, not so much force. If we think about a car going around a curve, then it's actually the centripetal force that prevents it from kind of coming off the road. And where does that kind of come from? This is, well, that comes from the tires on the road. And to kind of just kind of picture the car, we know that the car is going around in a circle. And so here we have our centripetal force, which is generated by friction, but it is a center pointing force, so we're going to call it a centripetal, centripetal force. And of course, since it does depend on the tires and the road, if the road is wet, or if the car is going too fast, then perhaps that frictional force isn't enough to be a centripetal force, and it's going to be insufficient, and so the car is going to skid off the road. So just kind of an example, suppose you take a turn and you make it sharper. So initially we have this guy, and we say, well, we're going to go ahead, we're going to make this much, 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 much sharper and we're actually going to half the radius. So the radius is going to be one half of what it was initially. Well, you know, force is going to be mass speed squared divided by radius. And let's just pretend, for example, that all these guys are one. So one times one squared divided by one. So the force would be equal to one. Now let's go ahead and let's half the radius. So it's going to be mass, I'm sorry, it's going to be one times 1 squared divided by a half, right? You know, we do know that 1 and a half, so half of what it was initially. So that's going to be 2. And we know that 2 is going to be double 1. One common misconception about the centripetal force is confusing it with the centrifugal force. Fugal is very different than centripetal. And centrifugal means center fleeing force. And, you know, what you might be thinking is, is, hey, you know, I know that if I'm in my car and I throw my physics textbook on the car next to me and I cut around a corner, so just like this, so this is going to be your car kind of going around the corner, and this is going to be your physics textbook, then heck, maybe, maybe even if your window is open, then the book's going to be go flying out the window. I'm sure you've lost a pair of sunglasses like that once or twice. And you might say there must be a force pulling that book outwards. So there's got to be some centrifugal force. So what's the deal with that? Well, it turns out that this force does not exist. It's just kind of a, a common misconception. And much like the physics textbook on the outside problem, what it boils down to is, is this idea of 
inertia. If you think about your physics textbook, or if you think about this can, it just keeps it just wants to keep on doing what it's doing. And in the case of right here, it wants to be going in that direction. And in the case of right here, it wants to be going in that direction. And if your car were to veer away from it, then well, it just keeps it just wants to keep on doing what it's doing. It just wants to keep on going in that direction right there. So there's nothing kind of pulling it outwards, but it does have inertia. Just like if you, you know, think about having some stuff in the back of your pickup truck and you come to a brief stop, then what's going to happen is this stuff's going to essentially go forward. Is there a force there? Absolutely not. This this box was just doing what it was doing, and before you stop your truck, then it was moving and it wanted to stay moving. The same is true for things going around in circles. And if, for example, this string were to break, then this can is going to do, keep on doing what it's doing, and it's just going to keep on going like that in a nice straight line. It has no memory of what it was doing. It's not going to do anything like that, and it's not going to do anything like that. Now, I always like to put my money where my mouth is, so this is me swinging a bucket of water um, pretty much over my head. Now, what's going on with this bucket? I'm going to go ahead and draw it um, directly over my head. Um, what's going on with it? Isn't there a force pulling it outwards? And there, isn't there a force in that direction right there? Um, the answer is no, there is no outward force. The water has what we call inertia. You keep on want to doing what it's doing. So here we have the water and it's traveling in that direction at that given instant. The problem is that the bucket gets in the way and here I am, I'm yanking the bucket inwards. So it is an inward facing force, not an outward facing force. So let's kind of come back and talk about this thing called a center of mass or a center of gravity. And it's kind of something we've been doing in the background. Up until this point, we've been kind of saying, okay, we have this box right here and we're going to just go ahead and we're going to push on it. So we're going to apply some force and it's going to move. But in reality, this box is, well, as large as the person that I drew it as. But what we've kind of been doing is we said, okay, we apply a force and this thing's going to move. What we've kind of been doing is we've just kind of been boiling down all of the mass and just kind of marking the average position, kind of the center of the box, if you will, and saying, okay, you know, the center of this box is going to move and it's going to move over here. So we've just, we're, we've already been doing this. So now I'm just kind of putting a definition to it. We've been treating it as if all of its mass behaves at the center of it. And if it's uniform, what that means is the center of mass is going to be in the middle of it. So if it's a box, it's going to behave um, just like it's right there. If it's like a board or something like that, what it's going to say, okay, well, you know, we have this board. Yes, it does have some horizontal and vertical extent, vertical extent but we're just going to treat, at, treat it as if all of its mass behaves in the center of it. And pretty much for this class, everything is going to be uniform. We're not going to have something that's a little bit heavier over here versus over here. Although, you know, kind of in your mind's eye, if this thing was, you know, a wrench or something like that, then yes, then this blue part right here is a little bit heavier, so the center of mass is going to be a little bit further over here. Um, in the case of this class, center of gravity can be used interchangeably with center of mass, and essentially what that is is we're talking about weights instead of masses, and if, if we had an object that was so large that the gravity field on it was not uniform, then the center of gravity would be different than the center of mass. But that's not going to be the case for this class. Now, kind of the usefulness of center of mass is that we can separate out translational motion from rotational motion simply by saying that if you've got an object that is rotating, then it's going to rotate about its center of mass. So here we have my proverbial wrench from earlier. And we're, we're going to say, okay, if we toss this wrench and this wrench is going to turn and it's going to move, then it's going to essentially just behave as if it's rotating about its center of mass and the translational motion or the linear motion is going to follow that center of mass. So you can kind of track this red dot and this red dot is going to look like a nice pretty parabola, which we would expect from just kinematics in two dimensions. How do we go about determining the center of mass with the center of gravity? Then essentially you can take an object, any object at all, and suspend it by one corner and just kind of drop a plumb line or drop a line with a weight on it. And you know the plumb line is going to go like that. And then you can say pick up pick the object up from the other corner and you know drop the plumb line, and that plumb line might go like this. And heck, you can even pick a third corner, pick this corner right here, and drop a plumb line. And where all of these lines intersect, then that's simply going to be what we would call the center of mass. You could do this for the continental US, or 
and it would kind of do one of those numbers. So hold it here, hold it here, and it would kind of be somewhere in this region right there where all the lines intersect is going to be the center of mass. This is also going to the point where you can go ahead and you can balance an object. So if we had some weird funky shaped object like this, and you could balance it about this point right here, then you would say, okay, well, the center of mass has got to kind of lie along this line right here. So where you can, where you can balance an object, um, your pen, for example, that's going to be the center of mass. One important consequence of the center of mass or gravity is this idea of stability. And essentially, as long as the center of mass or the center of gravity is located within the footprint of an object, then it's going to be in stable equilibrium, which means it's not going to fall over. So take example, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa right here, the center of gravity is you know, just right around about right there. It falls within the footprint, and so the Leaning Tower of Pisa is not going to fall over. We could take another object and say that the center of mass is going to be right there. Obviously, the center of mass falls within this footprint, so it's not going to fall over. But if we took this same object and we kind of tilted it over, then maybe right here, the center of mass would be kind of just about on the corner, just about on the footprint, and the footprint's kind of gotten a lot smaller. And what that means is it's far less stable. If we had the same object and we tipped it over even more, so now the center of mass was right about right here, go ahead, draw the line downwards, and you can see that it doesn't fall within the footprint anymore. So this object right here is not in equilibrium, and so it's going to fall over. Now, just kind of an aside, one of the homeworks uses the center of mass and torques and is, uh, it has a problem that looks pretty similar to this and I just want to kind of work our way through it. Uh, it says, you know, where, um, how much does this board weigh in order for this guy to balance out? So here we have a girl over here. She's kind of teeter-tottering about this point right here. And what's kind of the root behind this is, is we're going to say that the torque needs to be equal on this side and this side, so somewhere over here we have you know some um, force, some center of mass, and the question is is you know what is that mass? We know that the girl has a weight of 10 newtons and she's located um, 0 0.1 meters away from the side. So you know how much force is there? Well, the key to this is recognizing that this is a uniform board, so the center of mass has got to behave as if it's in the middle. So essentially it's got to be about, you know, 0 0.5 meters in, so it's 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 meters here. And what that kind of tells us is, is this distance right here has got to be 0 0.4 meters. And so what we're going to say is the torque on side 1, I'm going to call this side 1 and this side 2, has got to be equal to the torque on side 2. So the force times the distance on side 1 has got to be equal to the force times the distance on side 2. And I know what these guys are. Well, actually, I'm looking for this force. The distance right here has got to be 0 0.4 meters. And this has to be equal to force 2, which is 10 newtons, times 0 0.1 meters. So you go ahead and you do the math. And force 1 has got to be equal to 1 divided by 0 